Join us for highlights from the 2004 Louisiana Book Festival, including an interview with author Robert Kreis, Pulitzer Prize winning author Robert Olin Butler reading from his latest work, and writer Andre Kadrescu sharing from his most recent novel. Over 15,000 participants attended the festival to celebrate readers, writers, and their books. This book festival, just um, a tremendous celebration of reading, is so valuable to creating the right kind of attitude and atmosphere that we want to acknowledge in Louisiana. 125 authors and storytellers entertained the public at the state capitol. Honoring Shirley Ann Growl. The Louisiana Writer Award winner for 2004 is New Orleans writer Shirley Ann Growl, author of the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Keepers of the House. Ever since I can remember, uh, yeah, I've wanted to, uh, I wanted to write. It was just about the only thing I wanted to do. My family always despaired of finding something I liked. And you know, we had to be proper. And I don't think they ever really thought that writers were proper people, but they finally gave up. Robert Crace spent 10 years writing screenplays for Hollywood, including television series such as Cagney and Lacey, Miami Vice, and Hill Street Blues. Since turning his hand to fiction, Crace has published 11 novels. His character, Detective Elvis Cole, is featured in a continuing series of books. One of his novels, Hostage, is an upcoming major motion picture. LPB's Beth Courtney interviewed Grace in the Louisiana House Chambers. Bob, you know, you flavor or spice your novels with Louisiana references. I noticed this. Is it an homage? Are you nostalgic? Or you just have good taste? I, I just have good taste. Absolutely. You know, you, you can't grow up here and not love it. Uh, in fact, I was, I was joking with friends. Uh, I flew in because these people were loony enough to ask me to do this, which is a huge honor. And I feel like somehow I slipped in the back door. I mean, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm, I'm still 14 years old. Uh -huh. I'm, still, I'm still the kid in, you know, in, in Goodwood over there when there was an airport on the other end of the, of the property. And here I am in this you know, with, I mean, she runs a studio. Um, <laughs> First thing I did when I hit town, swung by the pastime for an oyster po' boy. I, I, know I'm, I, I know I'm in town because I immediately start to gain weight. <laughs> and it's great. So my loves and passions um, invariably find their way into the books. If you, if you uh, how, many, how many of you guys have read my work? I like you all very much. <laughs> um, uh, if you've read my work, you know that uh, Elvis Cole um, has, a, has a lady friend, friend named Lucy Chenier. She's from Baton Rouge. So there is in my books a continuing Louisiana presence. Uh, you know, and that's because I'm from here, and I, and I love this. And it's a way to get things like oyster po' boys and community coffee and a beat and, of beer. And a beat of beer. Uh, in, in, into the books. I think it, you know, they're a reflection of my sensibility, the things I enjoy, and hopefully when you read about that and uh, see a mention to Abita and Community Coffee, you like that too, and it's something therefore we share. And I like that. I like that notion that I share with you. Well, let's talk about that uh, journey you took uh, from here, now that you've come home, but you majored in mechanical engineering at LSU. Now, how was this a preparation for being a writer? Uh, it was no preparation whatsoever <laughs> for writing. <clears throat> but um, it, um, I, I did. I studied engineering. Um, it turns out quite a, few, quite a few writers study hard sciences. I'm not sure why that is, but, but we do. However, I always wanted to be a writer. I, um, you know, I grew up in Goodwood. Uh, across the street from Bon Marche before there was a Bon Marche. You know, I still remember as a small child when they drained the swamp, landfilled, and alligators were running across Florida Street. Uh, there was just a little airfield out there. But what there was also there was the Florida Drive-In Theater. Some of you may remember it. Um, when I was a kid, I, I literally lived in back of the theater. We were on that, on that street. Uh, I could climb the pecan tree in my backyard and, and see the screen. Even when I wasn't seeing the screen, all night, every night, we heard the soundtrack. 
because of the you know, 200 speakers that are all in those little poles at a thing, and they're all turned up full volume. And we were only a couple of hundred yards away from the, from the movie theater, so you could hear whatever was going on. And it was always great, delightful pictures, like Blood Feast, <laughs> you know, 2,000 Maniacs. Um, so I, I'm convinced to this day that it was all that inappropriate exposure to murder and mayhem that, that led me to, to be a writer. Yeah. I, but I, I understand, though, that you actually liked science fiction early on. I liked everything. But yeah, I was a big science fiction fan. A again, you know, there's, there's no... Uh, I imagine a lot of you like films. I mean, there's no cheesier movies than the movies shown on the Southern Drive-In circuit. Uh, we're not talking eight, right? I see uh, knowing looks, nods. Uh, it, you know, they're, they're always like motorcycle movies back in those days when Bruce Stern was a psychopath maniac, eyes bul bulging out. Uh, Jack, every Jack Nicholson movie ever made before he was Jack. Uh, you know, all monster things with... Uh, Viruses eating out people's brains. The Brain Eaters, that was a big one at the Florida Drive-In. Triple Bill on Halloween. Well, now, did you write at Baton Rouge High, though? Did your I started writing in... understand that you were a budding writer? Or was no, that no one understood. No. Um, <laughs> no. It was, I started actually writing in, in, uh, in junior high school. Uh, I was, whatever else I was, I was a voracious reader of all things. I loved comic books. Uh, the largest comic book collection? Is that what at one time, I, th I, I had the largest comic book collection in, in Baton Rouge. I had over 17,000 comic books. That's frightening. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, right. in retrospect, especially frightening. Right. Um, but I, uh, you name it, comic books, television, movies. Remember Count Macabre? Anyone? More head nods, right? Great, loved it. Warped my brain every day at 3.30 after school. Count Macabre with more horrible horror movies. Um, books. I, I, I fell in love with telling stories. Um, and pretty soon I realized that, that you know, someone out there was making up these things and that uh, when I couldn't consume enough, then I wanted to create my own. And that's when I started writing. What's the first uh, story you recall writing? Well, the first story I recall writing were, were comic book scripts because I would, I would I would write comic stories and then, and then draw them. And they usually involved uh, uh, monsters from space eating Baton Rouge. Mm. I'm not sure. And I remember one in particular, the plant exploded. Exxon exploded and poison gas clouds were coming across. And we all had to, to flee and everyone died at the end. Mm. Well, you now, know, that's not dissimilar from the novels I write now. This is true. Yeah. Nor the television shows you wrote for. That's true also. Correct. Yeah. Well, now, I understand that you have relatives, actually, who were in law enforcement. Yeah, so half, my, half my family worked for, for Exxon. Uh, my dad's side of the family, my mom's side of the family are all police officers. Everybody from, from uh, grandpa, great uncle, uh, all my uncles, uh, cousins, now their sons. So you have, uh, can go to them for uh, reference points in research? And I have, you know, it, because of my familiarity with police officers, I have an, an enormous network of, of uh, police sources at every level, from certainly local police departments, but FBI, Secret Service, DEA, um, sheriffs, police, you, you name it. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm, I like them much better than I like Hollywood people. Well, let's talk about Hollywood for a moment. You moved out to California. Yeah, if you want to write for Hollywood, you have to be in Hollywood. You think that's true? Yeah, I do Today? think that's true. Yeah. Well, because if Bruce calls you up and he wants to do rewrites on the script Thursday afternoon... That you know, Bruce you would be, be Bruce Willis. Yeah, my close personal friend Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're like this. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be there. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're here, then it's a problem because you have to get on the jet and go there. Because he doesn't come to you, you go to him. I and see. That's the way that works. Well, now, but when you went out there, your close personal friend Bruce Willis did not know who you were. That's true. No one knew who I right, was. Right. No. So, so what happened when you moved out to California? What? Give us the beginnings of your career. Um, I uh, moved out in the summer of 1976. Uh, I, I knew no one out there in the business. I, I had a friend I had I'd known from school who had an apartment there. Um, he put me up for a couple of weeks. I got the usual lame brain job people get when they, you know, lug in crates in a, in a mail room uh, and wrote every waking hour. Uh, 
I learned how to write scripts, which I'd never seen. I'd never seen a script. There was a, a bookstore in Hollywood called Collector's Bookstore. It no longer exists. They sold uh, secondhand teleplays for $2.50. And so I went and I bought some and uh, measured them, you know, like the script pages look, look odd. They're, you know, the, the dialogue is all in this little narrow column and the stage direction is wider. So I ran them through my old Smith Corona manual and, okay, that's what a script looks like. I started writing scripts and, and sold the second one I wrote and then I was off and running. For, for what show did Beretta, you? Beretta, Robert Blake's series, Beretta. Close personal friend? <laughs> At, At the, the time. time. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, we grew distant over the years. <laughs> well, you moved on to, uh, when, when did you write for Hill Street Blues? A couple years later. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I broke in on, on Beretta, which was a universal series. Um, I wrote several scripts for them in their final year. I like to joke that I'm the guy who killed the show. Um, the next year I went to work for Quincy. Uh, I was hired as a story editor. Actually, there was a connection there, because Beretta, at, at that time, Klugman and Blake were, were friends. And because Blake's series had ended and was canceled, um, Klugman had a horrendous reputation in town for chewing up writers and producers. The year I was working on Beretta, that same year on, on Quincy, Klugman had fired 11 writers and writer producers in one year. I mean, they were just, he would just chew them up and a matter of a day and spit them out. So when Beretta was canceled, Jack and uh, Robert were, were talking and, and Jack said, you got any good writers? Uh, you don't need them anymore. You're done. And, and Robert recommended me. So uh, Klugman called and we went in and he read some of my material and, and, we, and we met and he hired me as a story editor. At that time, I was the youngest story editor uh, on the Universal lot. I was 24. Wow. Yeah. So were there other writers that you admired that you were working with at that time? No, I was the only writer in the shop. It was horrendous. You were it? Yeah, were normally a, a, an hour show has about a half a dozen writers because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrific workload. You know, it, it takes a while to write a 60-page script, and, and they shoot them in about seven days. And once the camera starts to roll, they don't like to turn the camera off because television production is hugely, hugely expensive. So efficiently they like to just film one script after another after another after another without stopping um, well when they hired me remember Jack had fired everybody no good writer in town would work for him you know you had to be desperately hungry like this newcomer kid from Louisiana I'll do anything just let me type um, so for the first five months I was the only writer there and I wrote everything and it, I, I was working you know 15 16 18 hours a day at least two times a week it was a 24-hour all-nighter thing it was, uh, it was ugly. He finally hired, because uh, I, I was just, he got tired of hearing me beg. He, he finally hired two other writers uh, about five months in, and so three of us finished out the year. But I, I wrote something like 15 teleplays that year. Do you look back on that and see the written work that you did and think, how in the world did I do this? Do you look back at it fondly? Or? I actually look back on it kind of amazed that I could, I, I was very proud of myself because it was such a hard thing to do. Um, and, 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 and that I could survive it. Uh, and the work was pretty good. <clears throat> you know, I think I did better work later on other shows, but it was pretty good work for what it was. And um, it, 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 it was a tremendous learning experience for me. Well, you were nominated for an Emmy for Hill Street Hill Blues. Street Blues. Yeah. And, uh, that was a pretty good show. That was a pretty good show. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but that was a team of writers. So you reached the big time then in screenwriting. Well, it was... It was it, it, it was the big time. I mean, not because I was there, but, but Stephen Bochco and, and Tony Yurkovich had, had made it. Um, Anthony Yurkovich went on to create Miami Vice. He's sort of like the forgotten man in Miami Vice, but I think he's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, they made it great, and I was just privileged to, to be there work with them. But you told me your favorite show to work on was Cagney and Lacey. Cagney and Lacey. And, and why uh, was that? The, the, the writing staff. We had... Um, Probably the finest writing staff I've worked with. It was, it was uh, myself, it was a, a writer named April Smith, who's now a novelist, an excellent novelist, by the way. <clears throat> uh, Jeffrey Lane and Frank about Marco. Jeffrey Lane went on to run a, a comedy you might have seen called Mad About You. He's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Uh, and Frank went on to do long-form television. But the four of us, see, a writing, a writing team on a television 
series is a, is a very intimate relationship because you're locked together for long, intense periods of time. Uh, the reason it's intense is because it's you versus everyone else. When you're a writer in, in television in Hollywood, everyone screams at you. You know, you're the bad guy and the whipping boy for every studio executive, every line producer, every network executive, every censor, every, everybody, uh, actors, managers, actors, agents, the actors themselves, everybody in the process screams at the writers. There's never enough time to write it. Where is it? We want it yesterday. When you finally do write it, it's rotten and lousy and you've got to rewrite it. And everyone has something to say. So writers end up bonding together through this, you know, because it's ugly. You know, they throw eggs at us all the time. Um, are you seeing writers at the lowest? Bottom yeah. of the food chain. Bottom of the food chain. Bottom of the food chain. Uh, it's why so many writers go on to become producers or directors. Be, be, because, you know, you do it to protect yourself. One less person to scream at you. Hmm. <clears throat> but in that case, in the Cagney and Lacey case, we, we really uh, uh, bonded well, we worked well. I think it's probably some of the finest episodic television writing that, that I was part of. Well, you decided, though, that you wanted to shift that emphasis and that you wanted to abandon that world of television episodic writing. And now you focus on, on novels only, right? Books, yeah. I was tired Books. of getting screamed at. Tired of getting screamed at. So, uh, what, so, so now tell us about the first book that you wrote and how you got a publisher. Um, the first book I wrote was The Monkey's Raincoat, which was the first Elvis Cole novel. Um, right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. The monkey's raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I came. Uh, I had the first ten years of my career were pretty much exclusively in television. You know, I, I never, even though I went to Hollywood because I wanted to write in in television and film, I, I never thought of myself that that would be solely my career. When I was here, when, when I was writing my stories here, and my success did happen quickly in television, but what a lot of people don't see, you don't see the failure. I, I've been writing short stories since junior high school. I'd started submitting those short stories for publication in high school, and I didn't start to sell them, <coughs> pardon me, until my senior year at LSU. So... What was your first sales? The very first short story I sold was... Uh, uh, a piece, a fantasy story called With Crooked Hands to an original anthology called, um, um, what's it called? Clarion. Clarion. Clarion SF, edited by Kate. Well, see, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I've, I've forgotten because I'm elderly now. Uh, <laughs> and I got $50 for it. That was the first. But there were 116 rejections before I sold that mm -hmm. story. So there were a lot, of, a lot of times when people were saying no. So back to the first Elvis Cole. Oh, back to the first Elvis Cole. My point was, I wanted to write everything. I just didn't want to write TV. I wanted to write short stories. I wanted to write television. I wanted to write books. I just wanted to write everything. Still do. Um, after 10 years exclusively in television, I got fed up with all the shouting and all the um, um, lack of proprietary interest in television. You know, Hill Street Blues was a great show, a lot of fun to work on, but it's Stephen Bochco's show. Um, you know, when you're writing Miami Vice, which was Michael Mann and, and, and um, Tony Yurkovich's show, you may be writing the, the, most, the most wonderful teleplay you've ever written, and everything in your heart dictates that the perfect ending for the story is for Sonny Crockett to get shot and killed. You can't do that, right? He's got to be back next week selling white suits. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to be able to write stories the way I wanted to write them. So um, I, I went back to the notion of writing books and created my own characters. Well, tell us about Elvis. How did you, why Elvis? Why not? Why not? Right. Uh, <laughs> I've loved crime fiction for as long as I've been reading. Um, <coughs> one of my high school favorite things to read was uh, the work of Raymond Chandler. In fact, uh, some of you may remember, uh, I, don't, I don't think it still exists, but there was a, a store, a secondhand paperback store called Book Exchange. Um, I think it was... Still there. Still there. In the same place. What, what street? What, like 19th or 20th? Yeah. Okay, well then that, yeah, that, that store. I discovered uh, Raymond Chandler there. 
I picked up a uh, paperback copy of Chandler's The Little Sister. And I'll be honest with you, the only reason I bought it is because they had a really good looking girl on the cover. <laughs> it was like 19 cents. And I fell in love with Raymond Chandler's words, his language, uh, the whole notion of Philip Marlowe. And that was my first private eye novel to read. I knew that I wanted to do that. I knew that one day I would write detective fiction. And when it was time for me to write books, I, uh, you know, I, I, like Calvin and Hobbes, I, I, I like to think that I have a transmogrifier. <laughs> so <clears throat> because I wanted to write a novel in the first person format, you know, I did this, I saw this, mm -hmm. um, it ended up that a lot of my worldview was transmogrified into this character named Elvis Cole. And uh, he became a very personal, I mean, I am not Elvis Cole. Uh, I'm not a, nearly as good at anything as Elvis Cole is. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not as funny. I'm not as cool. I'm not, uh, uh, certainly not as brave or, or, or tough or any of those things. Uh, I'm just some guy who sits in a room all day and types. But the inner me that I like to think about, um, I think he's manifest in, in, in the characters in Elvis Cole and Joe Pike. Who is Joe Pike? Joe Pike is his partner. Well, I know Joe, he's his partner, but. Who is Joe model, Pike? Yeah, who is Joe Pike? Um, well, Joe Pike, of course, is, is the secret me I would like to be if I really were tough. Oh. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, the, the wimpy guy I am. No, no. Um, something I didn't say in the bio, but looked up on your website, and you have a very nice website, I might add. Um, 2001 People Magazine Sexiest Author. I, I, did that change you. your life? Thank you, Beth, for bringing that yes, up. Yes, I know. I, I, I especially like your response on, uh, on the website. It said something like, no one at Baton Rouge High would believe that. Is that true? Of course it's true. <laughs> Jesus, come on. No one believes it now. My mother's sitting over there. When Here's how I found that out. Now, this isn't anything anyone asks for, right? I mean, I, I don't know how they divine that. They throw bones or dice or some, something, but... I was on book tour for whichever book had come out at that time, and I was in an airport in Canada. And uh, my phone rang, and, and it was my publicist. And I don't know why she was calling. For all I knew, you know, they had arranged for me to speak to the Rotarians in the next town I was going to. And she says, <clears throat> can anyone hear me where you are? I said, I'm sitting in the airport in Toronto. She said, okay, I'm about to tell you something. You can't breathe a word of this to anyone. This is top secret. I'm thinking, I mean, you know, I'm on book tour. I write, I write detective novels. What could be top secret? She said, she said, no, I'm serious. You can't tell anyone. You can't tell your agent. You can't tell your wife. You can't tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. I said, what? She said, OK, get ready. People magazine has selected you as the sexiest author of the year. I said, what did you say to that? that well, I, I said, that's what I had to get ready for? <laughs> I said, Are you, is this a joke? No, 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 you can't tell anyone because if you tell anyone, if you tell anyone right now and word gets out that you've told someone that People Magazine has selected you for this, they'll take it away and cancel it. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I won't. She says, now, this is serious book business. Now, I don't know anything about this, and now she's educating me. She says, this issue of the magazine that they do sells more issues, more copies of, of that issue than any other issue that people does in the entire year. You know where they have the sexiest man alive thing and it's always right. Mel Gibson or Pierce Brosnan? Right. Okay. That, that issue sells more than every... So she says, you know, like, whatever, 63 million people are going to see this, so we might sell a couple of books. That's right. <laughs> so now I'm thinking, I'm not going to tell anyone because <laughs> I don't want them to take it away. We, what we want to know, did it actually boost book sales a lot? I sold a couple of books. Yeah. So, so it actually worked. Your publicist was right. Well, it, you know, it, it, every, all of this, the book business is a strange game. Um, it, you don't know what's going to work, what's, how, how things, why would anyone pay any attention to, I mean, what, whether I am or not, I've got to tell you a funny story. Because I don't believe for, I mean, again, I'm still 14 years old and riding my bike around the airport. Um, so... Top secret, of course. Now I have to go back to Los Angeles where they're going to do this whole photo shoot and there's, you know, 
and, and for, for the magazine. So I go back there. No one knows why I'm there except, of course, I go to the studio in downtown, urban, gritty L.A. I don't know why they wanted downtown, urban, gritty, but that's what we did. So I go, I go and they bring me, they have someone bring me down there, and they bring me down there, and I walk in this room, and here's this photographer. They had to go all the way to Sweden for some photographer. I don't know why. I guess we didn't have one in Los Angeles, but they brought in some guy from Sweden, and he's got all his staff, you know, all these, all these emaciated women wearing black, you know, the makeup people, hair people, all this other, I got no hair, you know, I mean, all, all these people, and they're all staring at me when I walk in. And you know what, here's what I'm thinking, I'm thinking, they don't think I'm sexy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, I, hear, I hear whispers in the back, I think it's Swedish, and I know what they're saying. Why'd they pick this guy? Funny. Well, sold a couple of books. Sold a couple of books. Well, um, uh, so how many are in the series now, the Elvis Cole? Um, um, a nine. Nine. Coming out, a new one. Uh, a new one's coming out February 15th. February 15th. Yeah, The Forgotten Man. And I understand, you've told many interviewers, that you will never put Elvis in... I won't sell the film rights won't sell the to film. Elvis and Cole. And why is that? Um, because... I, I, I don't, see, I, uh, I think of Elvis and Joe as sort of, uh, they're my guys. Ultimately, they're my, gonna, I'm going to be known for those characters. Whatever else I write, I'm going to continue to write Elvis and Joe. That's my life's work. <clears throat> and to me, books are special. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm so complimented that you guys asked me to be, to come here and do this for, for the Louisiana Book Festival. Um, Books are better than movies and TV. Uh, and, at least for me, they are, and, and, and here's why. Um, I mean, I've done it all. I've done TV, I've done movies. As much as I love that stuff, that's an observational medium. So you write it, you film it, it's up there. Bruce Willis looks like Bruce Willis. When you see him, you're seeing Bruce Willis, which is great. Uh, but when I write a book, see the book, this this isn't the end result of what I do. This is just uh, a conduit for, uh, between me and you. The end result of, of, of what I do doesn't occur until you read this. And when you read this, something happens up here and you're creating your personal movie of what's in here and it's unlike anyone else's movie. And through this, you and I collaborate. I get to touch each one of you separately and individually, and together we make whatever's in your head. Movies don't do that now that it's television. And, to, and that's a very special thing. So when you guys read an Elvis Cole novel, each one of you has your very own Elvis Cole and very own Joe Pike. And my, one of my big fears is that if, uh, if I allow Elvis and Joe to be made into a film, even a very good film, that thereafter, whoever that actor is, whatever that ambiance in reality is, somehow it's going to affect what you, the readers, create when you read subsequent books. And I don't, I don't want that to happen. So um, I'll keep Elvis and Joe just on the, on the page and between us. And that's where I think he belongs. Well, you know, El <laughs> Thank you. Uh, L.A. Requiem, uh, one reviewer said uh, that this was sort of a watershed, that you had multiple storylines, flashbacks, a more complicated book. Do you, yeah. do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, that's absolutely true. It absolutely. Was, it was a, for me, it was a watershed event, the way I tell stories. It was much bigger, broader, more complicated and layered. Uh, and in fact, since L.A. Requiem, the way I approach my novels has, has, has changed. The first seven books are much more traditional, classic Chandlerian first-person private eye. <clears throat> Since then, the, the, the books all have um, a, a much more complicated and, I think, textured and layered structure. Uh, also, one reviewer I was reading, a number of them said that you, um, although you're a mystery writer, you have a solid literary base. Makes, a, makes me sound pretty good, doesn't it? Tremendous compliment, yeah. yes. Yeah, I yeah. like that a lot. 
Yeah. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what it means, by the way. <laughs> explain. Um, yeah. <laughs> As they say, explain. <laughs> but it, it, it sounds real good, and I like that. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I take it to mean is, is, is that I'm writing something that touches you on the most human part of yourself. Um, now, if, if that reviewer is wrong, then I don't want to know it. Uh, but if they're right, then it pleases me, because that's really what writing is about to me. Again, it gets back to that collaboration thing. You know, it isn't, it isn't just, um, for me, it isn't just laying, laying uh, bricks or typing words on page. You know, I, for me, the specialness of what I do, what brings me my, my greatest fulfillment is, is that I can touch people and, and, uh, and interact with so many human beings. Uh, I just find that very, very special, and I enjoy it. What's your day like? Do you write, you write in the morning, in the afternoon, all the time? I, I Give us your... Yeah. I get up around 4, 4.30 every morning. Uh, I, I go to the gym. Uh, I get home. I'm typically writing by around 6.30. I write... Uh, <clears throat> my year is kind of broken in two. The first half of a book, I'll, I'll knock off work in mid-afternoon. Um, as I get closer and closer to deadline, then I start to work later and later hours. So in the last half of a book, as I, as I start to sweat the deadline, uh, you know, I'll go 12, 15 hours, whatever it takes. And it's usually seven days a week. Mm. Yeah. And when you finish, do you just, then you have to do the book tour thing. When I finish, I then I have to rewrite the book. Rewrite the book. Right. And then I have to write the next book. And in there is the, uh, is the book tour, which I really enjoy. I, not, most writers don't enjoy book tour. Most writers complain and bellyache and whine about going on the road. Uh, I actually enjoy it because, because I like doing this. I like meeting readers. I like meeting booksellers. Um, and also, it's the one time of the year when I, I, they let me out of the house. So I, I tend to enjoy it. I'm, that's, my t that's when I'm paroled. <laughs> and then when that's done, I go back to work, well, which speak. isn't fun at all. Now, you've only said one of your books uh, in Louisiana, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, I live in Los Angeles. Oh, you have, um, you have an imagination. But, but I've only set, uh, Voodoo River is set here. Right. Um, the... Um, I think I, I, you know, the, the ongoing presence of Lucy Chenier gives me, at least in my head, a continuing Louisiana presence. You know, now Elvis and Lucy are having some problems, and um, it, it, it is possible that well, he doesn't in the, put her first. Clearly. In, the, in the coming, in the coming <laughs> books, uh, he does the best he can. <laughs> it, Elvis, Elvis might be making trips down here, but. Um, We'll have to see. I'm actually, I, I'm, this isn't on my near-term schedule yet. I've actually been noodling an idea for a, a non-Elvis Cole um, multi-generational crime novel set here in, you know, that's probably the family influence, but set here in, um, in Louisiana. And I, I'm still having some problems with it. I hope that one day that's going to suddenly flower and I'll see what I want to do because this place here, Louisiana, is, is such a, uh, a, a rich canvas uh, within which to, to create fiction that, you know, it's just begging for, you know, great novels to be written with this as a locale. What do you read when you're not writing? Mostly nonfiction. Um, I used to be a voracious fiction reader, but I've found over the years, perhaps because I, I write so much and so intensely and in what I write is fiction, that <clears throat> I need a total disconnect at the end of the day to unwind and re relax. So uh, uh, mostly what I read is magazines and then, and then, and then nonfiction books on a variety of, variety of topics. Tell us about the two books that were not in the Elvis Cole series, the most recent ones that are... Demolition Angel and Hostage. Right. Uh, Demolition Angel is um, uh, about a, an LAPD bomb former bomb technician uh, named Carol Starkey, who's now a continuing character in the Elvis Cole novels. <clears throat> that book uh, was the first non-Elvis Cole book I wrote. Uh, we sold the film rights to that, too. That's uh, supposed to be turned into a movie at, at Columbia TriStar. Terrific producer bought it, a guy named Lawrence Mark. Uh, Larry Mark has made a ton of movies, and he's made some excellent movies. Among them, uh, he produced Finding Forrester. He produced Jerry Maguire, uh, just a, a ton of terrific movies. Um, I'm not sure that's ever going to be made. But 
The other book, Hostage, was about a guy named Jeff Talley, who's a uh, former LAPD uh, hostage negotiator <coughs> whose uh, family ends up kidnapped and trapped between the mob and some maniacs in a house, and uh, Jeff has to rescue them. We, that's the one. We sold the film rights to that to, uh, to Bruce Willis. Uh, it has been filmed. It's in the can, and right now they're looking at a January 21st release date. That's called, and I was told that was a soft date, meaning that's their target date, but, but it could vary a couple of weeks in either direction, depending. You know, right now they're in that period where they, where they test it, the audience test it, and, and depending upon the grades that, that the test audiences give, they recut, they, they diddle around with things, they alter the music, and that kind of stuff. Do they let you come to the uh, premiere, and are you now no longer on the bottom of the food chain since it's your book? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, in Hollywood, the screenwriter is the bottom of the food chain, but they view novelists differently. And I, I, uh, I, I like to think, you know, because screenplays are only 120 pages long, but like the manuscript for, for a, a book like this might be five or 600 pages. Uh, and, I, and I just know they hold this big stack of pages in, in their hands, and they, they kind of and they say, look how many words he knows. <laughs> and and that, that impresses them. Um, so they tend to view the novelist with, with, with a certain respect. When I was uh, on the set of Hostage, uh, and I went out there many times, uh, they, they treated me very, very, very well. You know, a lot of the, the cast and crew were bringing up copies of the books for me to sign, and, 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 and they made me feel welcome. Uh, tell me about the Sony uh, executive chief who wanted the Elvis Cole oh, well, books. Yeah, we were, <coughs> Beth and I were talking earlier about, you know, I don't, I'm one of the few writers in, in California, I don't want to direct, I don't want to, I don't want to produce, I don't want to write screenplays other than maybe just, you know, based on my own novels. I just have no interest, I'm a novelist, that's what I do. Um, when, when Columbia bought Demolition Angel, then they, they decided they wanted to give me the hard press for uh, the Elvis Cole books. So Sony Studios at that time was uh, run by a man named uh, John Calley. Been around forever. I mean, he, he, in his 70s, he had, he had run almost every studio in town. <clears throat> so he calls me in, and we have this meeting. And, you know, his office is about this big. And it's one of those Citizen Kane type, type moments, you know, where, and here's this guy, and, you know, he's on the couch, and he's kind of flowing back on the couch, you know, like, like this, and I'm on my couch over there, and he says, Robert, he says, I think you should direct L.A. Requiem as a film. I said, I said, John, I don't want to be a director. He said, well, Robert, you know, you don't have to direct because tell you the truth, no one likes directors. It's just some guy behind the camera. He shoots his film. I don't like it. No one likes it. We don't like him very much either, but perhaps you would want to produce the movie. You could be a producer. Now, at that time, I'd entered into this arrangement with Larry Mark, and I said, well, you know, Larry's my producer on, you know, I have no interest in producer, and he says, well, it's so easy. He said, you should just do it anyway, and that way you can control everything. And I said, I said, John, I don't want to be the producer. I'm not going to sell the Elvis Cole novels to you. I'm, I'm just not interested in directing, producing, any, any, any of that. He thought about it, and he says, well, you know, that's probably just as well, too, because Here's the truth of this business. None of us know anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and this guy's run every studio in town. And I've been out there for 25 years working it. And it, this is the, the most honest, truthful thing anyone <laughs> in that business has ever told me. Poet and novelist Andre Kudrescu is currently a distinguished professor at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He's well known as a regular commentator on national public radio and has written and starred in the Peabody Award-winning movie, Road Scholar. He reads from his latest novel, Wakefield. Well, I wrote this book uh, um, 
wonderfully prescient, actually, writing this book, Wakefield, because it's about a motivational speaker who makes a deal with the devil at the end of the 90s. And when I wrote it, the devil was pretty big. Don't get me wrong. But it's gotten a lot bigger since the election. So it's terrific now that I can uh, read from this book and, um, and know that I was right. The reason my character Wakefield uh, makes a deal with the devil is that he's a middle-aged man who's getting pissed off. He's mad because uh, the city he lives in is going through some kind of renewal. A maniac next door is restoring an old house and he can't sleep, think, or write. Uh, he's on the road quite a bit, uh, motivating the workers of America, but not really, because the people who, are, who hire him uh, are hiring him actually not to motivate the workforce to do better, because they have a terrible sense of dread and doom. They're actually hiring him to bring them down secretly, because the workers are already over-motivated, the economy is overheated, and somebody's got to stop this terrible enthusiasm that goes on at the end of the 90s, that ancient decade, which some of you might remember. Um, so Wakefield proceeds to, uh, on his way to, to fulfill his duties and makes various kinds of observations. But of course, this trip, this, this trip that the book describes is complicated by the fact that the devil showed up and uh, proposed certain things to him. And the devil is a character in here in Safari. as he accompanies devil. I mean, he accompanies Wakefield on his trip, sometimes with Wakefield knowing it, sometimes not. And uh, the devil is then a character uh, worth uh, you know, your time, because he's, he's, uh, he's interesting in many ways in which Wakefield is naive. Um, another, another reason for writing this book was that uh, really uh, a, a, an impetus uh, was reading a wonderful story by Nathaniel Hawthorne called Wakefield. Hawthorne wrote this in the middle of the 19th century. It's a story about a London clerk who goes to work one day in the morning, uh, puts on his Hamburg and his umbrella under his arm and heads for his job in some office and doesn't come back for 20 years. So in the story, Hawthorne speculates that uh, Wakefield may have taken quarters across the street from his house and he's watched his wife in his house for 20 years. The genius of, Wake, of the Hawthorne story is that uh, Hawthorne never s asks why uh, Wakefield did this. He mainly wonders what Wakefield did in those 20 years when he was absent. So in days without television, or you know, what did Wakefield do in a room for 20 years? Great question. As to the why, I mean, there was no reason to ask why, even by the end of the, by the middle of the 19th century, because Wakefield was a clerk. He had to go to work every day. He had certain duties. He was already caught in the industrial machinery of a time that didn't give him any time for himself. He was completely a cog in this, in the, in the machine of, um, uh, of work. And so when I. S when I read that story, I thought, well, how about having a 20th century Wakefield? It's the end of the 20th century. They're di these are different times. And here is a man who feels, for the most part, that he's absent from his own life. Until, of course, the devil shows up. And then things change. Now, the great thing about the devil in literature is you don't have to introduce the devil. You, know, you just say the devil shows up, and everybody knows, because uh, it's been such a figure of uh, our culture for so long. So I'm going to read just the first chapter from Wakefield, and um, um, you know I will, I will leave some of it in suspense for you so you can buy the book and I can sign it over there. It begins with a quote from Hawthorne, and it's, uh, Hawthorne says in his story, imagination in the proper meaning of the term made no part of Wakefield's gifts which might seem that uh, Hawthorne is dissing Wakefield, but he's not. I think it's what Hawthorne is saying, really, is that even no matter how much imagination Wakefield could try to expand on escaping his condition, he really couldn't do it already. Prologue, late in the 20th century. One day the devil shows up. I've come to take you. I'm not ready, says Wakefield. Why not? You don't have any reason to live. 
Wakefield is scandalized. Are you crazy? What kind of a thing is that to say to a man in the prime of his life? You're a failure. Time to die. The devil is bored. Hey, he has this argument, what, six, seven times a day? Nobody welcomes death. They are ready for it. They need it. But when it comes right down to it, they won't go. What do you mean a failure? I'm quite well respected. All right, size satanic. I'll play the game. Why do you want to stay? Worried about the people you'd leave behind? I have no interest in people, Wakefield pronounces haughtily, drawing himself up and looking down on the thinning fur between the horns of the unholy one, who's actually fairly short. I just want to be left alone. He tries to slam the door in the devil's face, but the devil's got a hoof in it. Okay, so you're a loner. No loved ones, no next of kin, no pets, nothing to live for but a few bad habits. That's not what I said. I've got lots of friends. Wakefield sounds doubtful. My daughter Margot would probably be very upset. The devil sees an easy shot and takes it. Don't kid yourself, buddy. You haven't seen your daughter in years. We both know that. Tell the truth. What's the real reason you want to stick around? The bit about the daughter is unfair. He talks to Margot on the phone every two weeks. He's not a model father, but he's no deadbeat. Well, actually, there is some reading I'd like to do. Wakefield improvises, gesturing to the crammed bookshelves that line the walls of his garret. That's a real thigh slapper. You can read when you're disemboweled, nothing to stop you, but I haven't got all day. You've read enough to know how it works. Wakefield does know how it works, in books. You keep the conversation going. Keep the devil talking until you find a way out. It's like this. I honestly wasn't expecting to see you. Couldn't you give me another chance? Wakefield puts on his most sincere expression. I've had this feeling for a while, like I went wrong somewhere, that maybe I should have lived a different life. Oh, sole mio. I hate the bookish ones. It ain't like reincarnation, friend. I don't know anyone who thinks they've lived the right life, but they all think it's been some kind of dream. I have only one question. Do you believe in me? This is important to the Diablo. He's obligated by, by an ancient professional code to give believers another chance. Unbelievers, he just scoops up and closes the book. If you don't like it, contest it in court. The afterlife is one long hearing. Oh, I believe in you, don't get me wrong. I read somewhere that there's a black hole at the center of the universe, some kind of supermassive gravity that not even light can escape from. That's you, right? Sure, that's me. There are a lot of us, actually. So don't you have to give me another chance if I believe? El Malefico rolls his eyes at the stars where his dark bearded masters sit around the fire eating the souls he's brought them. Yeah, well, what do you say? Can't we make some special arrangement? I'm not the most demanding of men, to quote Frank O'Hara. The devil's lower back is beginning to bother him, standing in a drafty doorway like this. You think I could sit down for a minute, pal? I'm under no obligation, you understand, but we could perhaps discuss your request. That's more like it, thinks Wakefield, ushering in his guest. Maybe I could get you a drink. I know I could use one. What will it be? Scotch, grunts the devil, easing himself into a plump leather armchair. The cell phone in Wakefield's pocket has been vibrating at intervals throughout this encounter. While he prepares the drinks, he listens to his messages. There is one from his lecture agent urging him to take a gig for half his usual fee. His friend Ivan, his only friend, inviting him to a poker game his broker trying to sell him shares in the new IPO, and his ex-wife, Mariana, who wants to talk about their daughter. Wakefield pours his own drink extra deep. The devil, meanwhile, is checking out Wakefield's digs. The guy's got good taste for a schmo, he thinks, admiring the Murano chandelier, the faded kilims, the three fake Netsuke in pornographic poses on the mantelpiece, next to a few family photos a woman with bouffant, a man in Sunday suit, a boy with baseball bat. Bought at the flea market like most families these days. 
He's got a soft spot for fakes. The devil has a collection of family photos taken from the offices of middle-aged men he's collected at their desks. He had taken the men first, then for his own pleasure, their family pictures. Invariably, these turned out to be fakes, props, simulacra of real families, which is what made them desirable in his world, where value is based entirely on the differential between the fake and the genuine. The bigger the lie, the greater the value. The phony photos left no doubt he'd scooped up the right souls. I think you'll enjoy this whiskey, says Wakefield, returning with her drinks. It's a single malt, a gift from one of my fans. He takes a seat opposite the dark one who sips the scotch and nods his approval. I haven't been the best host, have I? Wakefield goes on, just talking about myself, what I want, and so on. What about you? It can't be easy, wandering the earth, always on call. Wakefield's phone vibrates again, and the buzz is audible in the quiet room. Turn that damn thing off, will you? Noise drives me crazy. The devil growls, swallowing the rest of his whiskey in one gulp. You're the one with the supernatural powers. You turn it off, blurts Wakefield, forgetting his manners. I'm sorry to disappoint you, the devil says apologetically, but I have no power over cell phones, computers, cable TV, satellite communications, or microwaves. No, it's true, really. Things used to be more simple, more fun. I enjoyed the frivolous and pleasant existence as a beloved, comic, quasi-fictional character. It was great. Classic literature, opera, ballet. He sighs deeply, then leans closer to Wakefield. Then, one year. I went from being revived at the Bolshoi to being deified by Khomeini and Falwell. Since then, it's been a mess. A bunch of religious freaks spouting tacky rhetoric demanding apocalypse-sized work. I don't want to play world ender for these lunatics. I was looking forward to a lighter quota, maybe some R&R &R in the arms of a kinkishly altered soprano. Wakefield is astonished by this outpouring. Who knew the devil had such middle-aged problems? Poor old Pan, weeping in his mossy cave as the blinding light of a neon cross invades his darkness and his joy. Wakefield, too, regrets the passing of the pagan era and could almost hug the old goat, but he's got a deal to make. How would you like an opportunity to cut down your workload and postpone some of that heavy eschatological lifting? Give me a chance to find my true life. If I succeed, you, and you'll be the judge of that, of course I get to go on living. If I fail, well, you do what you have to do. It would be a hell of a lot more relaxing than smiting and scourging on a massive scale. The devil is tempted. In his profession, gambling is the only way to pass eternity which just doesn't pass, and is subject to multiple interpretations and migraines. How long do you figure this business will take? The dark one asks, putting his hooves up on the low table. Oh, I don't know, Wakefield pretends to calculate. A year, two years, max. The devil, the devil is toying with his empty whiskey glass. Wakefield fetches the bottle from the kitchen and pours them another stiff one. It would have to involve some travel, you know. You can't just stay in this apartment. Nice place, by the way. No problem, Wakefield hastily agrees. I travel a lot in any case. The sucker's going for it, he congratulates himself. The devil falls silent, savoring his second whiskey. He closes his tired yellow eyes, and for a moment, Wakefield imagines he's asleep until he's, he grunts and his eyes flutter open. And you'd have to bring me something from every place you go. Bring you something like what? A souvenir, something valuable, some kind of sacrifice. He's trying to be cooperative. Can't say, really, something you think I'd like. Could be anything. Are you sure you don't want something more abstract? Isn't it customary to take my soul in this kind of exchange? That's how it works in Faust, The Master and Margarita, all the classic texts. Give me a break, the devil growls. I'm drowning in souls. It's a buyer's market. Look out the window and see for yourself. A line of young women stretches out of sight down the sidewalk. Wakefield knows what they're waiting for. A famous director is shooting a movie in the neighborhood, and the girls are there to audition. 
The director has already cast the role. The audition is just a way for the old guy to get some nookie. Wakefield sees the devil's point. So you really don't want my soul. You're assuming that you have one. But whether you do or you don't, I don't want it. I want a thing, pure thingness, something that proves you found this so-called true life. Beyond that, the vortex of terror and self-doubt, my simple request has it created in you is adequate compensation. We have a deal, Wakefield. If you agree to these terms, I'll give you one year. It's an outlandish opportunity, but now that my existence has, existence has been proved by the discovery of black holes, I can afford to be a little generous. Wakefield considers the practical aspects of the journey. What about the people who depend on me? My ex-wife, my daughter, the credit card companies, the people listed in my cell phone. They won't even notice that you're gone. So when would this spiritual scavenger hunt begin? Wakefield asks, sounding more relaxed than he feels. You must listen for the sound of the starter pistol, says the devil super mysteriously, holding up his empty glass. But for now, you can pour me another drink. Thanks. Um, so. Author of 10 novels, Pulitzer Prize winning writer Robert Owen Butler taught at McNeese University in Lake Charles for 16 years. He currently teaches creative writing at Florida State University. Butler's latest work draws from his collection of postcards. Each chapter in his book originates from a single card, his characters created from messages written long ago. I, I began the collection early on realizing I was a kind of caretaker of these lost moments of emotion by somebody long since passed away. But ultimately, the, it, it was a, a, a larger, it was more of a legacy. I, I realized that, in fact, I was more than a caretaker. I had taken on the task of, through my imagination, giving that fuller, complete, completed life uh, to these, these real people. So let me, have, in the time left here, I'd like to read one of these stories to you. And if you, um, if you listen to National Public Radio, you may have heard this story read. Um, the, um, Symphony Space had, um, in New York uh, did this story, but um, it, given the state of the world and recent events and what's going on, I thought this might be a good story to read. This is based on a picture, a photo card, a real photo postcard. A bizarre, bizarre image. It's a, it's a steaming pot in the foreground. And the steam is so intense, in fact, that it's overexposed the film where the steam is going up. But behind the pot stands a middle-aged woman, rather stout, in a black gabardine dress with her, her um, watch pinned to her chest in a cloche hat with a kind of intense look on her face. And she and the pot are both standing in the bottom of a World War I trench. And you can even see up above, at the top of the trench, a, a doughboy passing by with a campaign hat. The message on this card is simply written underneath the image in hand. It says, Mother in the Trenches. So this is in her voice. With a world full of foolishly dangerous men, what's a mother to do? Like all the mothers of the world, I am stuck with the barbarian Kaiser Wilhelm, a man full of himself, but as hollow as a souffle, and that well-meaning fool of a schoolmaster, Woodrow Wilson. I have known men like this all my life, being around preachers and teachers, and also around my father, rest his soul, who was himself a bit of both. Men who are certain they grasp things that no man can grasp for certain. And Blackjack Pershing, another kind of man, like the one I married, a man with quick, sure hands, I'd wager, and a single-minded bond with other men under whatever flag it might be, American for General Jack and my own Jack, and there's nothing in the world to weaken that bond or soften those hands. My son is a man, too, according to the Selective Service Act, but God help me if I'll let him be a man yet without a fight. This is something I know like any mother knows, 
The boy is not fully a man if I can remember so clearly lifting his wee body up and placing it on a rectangle of cotton clean from the boiling pot and warm from the sun, and I swaddle him up and hold him against me, and he is gentle and he is quiet, and I carry him away, carry him through the world, and all the while he is taking in the things I know as his mother, as a woman, but cannot say cannot even put into words except to hold him close and whisper softly to him that he is a good boy and I love him. They eat rats. I have heard people speak of this. They live in water so, f so foul that their feet swell and rot away. They cannot sleep for fear of the guns. They kill each other. My son was taken away to this kind of life. And so I packed a bag because my husband Jack was dead of influenza now and could not stop me. And I boarded a ship and I went to Paris. And I hired a man who had already paid for all this madness of other men. One of his arms was merely a stump from the early days of the war. And he drove me in a cart into the countryside and we slept in the fields along the way. And it was June and there was no rain and he spoke a little English, and on one of the nights as we neared the front, he said from the dark a ways off behind some other tree, Madam, you look at your son, yes? I knew what he meant. Yes, I said, we. Oui. There was a long silence, and then he said, You are the mother of me also, yes? I have my hands full, I said, which I'm not sure he understood, but he said no more. I could hear a very faint thumping on the horizon down the road. The next day, there was a thin stream of civilians passing us. Most of them had already left this place up ahead, I assumed. These refugees had no ur sense of urgency as one might expect, but moved with a terrible weariness about them. A mother on foot, carrying her infant, lifted her face as we passed, and her eyes seemed very old though she was quite young. She was perhaps as young as my son. I could have been the infant's grandmother. I glanced over my shoulder as we passed, and she too had turned her head. I looked before me again. Edward was my only living child. Private Edward Marcus Gaines of the 108th Infantry, 27th Division, Company, such and such, I had it written down in this letter, in a trench, in a place in France. He had no infant child. He and I faced something together here in this foreign place. The end of our blood. I thought of the young woman we'd passed and of holding her child just for a moment, stopping the cart, and she would have stopped too, and I would climb down, and she would come to me, and she would say, perhaps in her own language, but I would know what she meant. Here, she would say, hold him. And so I would, and then I'd give him to his mother, and I'd say, carry him off now, quickly. There was a smell of burning in the air. The cart creaked in the ruts of the road. With each turn of the wheel, there was a sound as if it would break. This one-armed man next to me muttered under his breath, I assumed to his horse. The explosions had ceased up ahead. I drifted into sleep, and for a time I was in Yonkers, tending my roses, and the morning was bright and quiet, and it was hot already. It was summer. The air hung heavily about my shoulders. In the dream, it was only me and the roses, and I was clipping the faded heads. I worked steadily, but the garden was full of dead roses. The scissors chinked and chinked with a sound like a turning wheel. And I awoke to tents passing and the rumble nearby of motorized vehicles with armor plating upon them. And I got down from the cart and found my way through a trail of foolish men who were astonished to see me, but but compliantly helpful. And at last, I was with an officer who had the authority to deal with my needs. We sat on reed chairs in a tent that smelled of grass and earth. My son had written, Mother, the men suffer here greatly, those who have been here a long while. These are the French and the British and the Australians mostly where I am. I am filthy already, though it is all right because I feel like one of them. This colonel before me 
was not filthy at all. He was quite properly clean and starched, and his uniform rustled with gentility as he leaned forward and offered me tea. You found the right place, he said, sitting back and holding his teacup with a steady hand before his face. But I must ask you why. What is it that you wish to do here for your son? I had not put the question to myself with this sort of bluntness. The colonel reminded me of my husband. I had learned long ago with Jack to be prepared for the direct question, but he would ask for answers that were rarely as simple as he wanted them to be. I had not prepared myself for this similar moment with a stranger. I sipped my tea. The colonel waited, lifting his own cup to his lips. After both our cups settled back in their saucers and I kept silent for a moment more, he asked, are you opposed to our entry into the war? I am an American, I said. I am a patriot, as is my son. I'm sure you are, the colonel said. He nodded very faintly to me. His face was long and heavily jowled, the face of a man with grandchildren. I was still trying to find an answer to his question for myself as well. I know there are things that need to be done, my son wrote to me, and I'm glad to be the one to do them instead of another fellow. But I have always spoken the truth to you, Mama. I am afraid. My son did not ask me to come, I said. He is a brave boy. He has a brave mother, the colonel said. I want to see him is all. I could think of nothing to add to this. The colonel seemed to consider taking another sip of his tea, but I knew men like him. He didn't actually like tea. He didn't like sitting in this delicate way with another person. He didn't like having to deal with emotions he could not understand. The colonel put the cup of tea on the table beside him. He squared around to me. It was time to get down to the business of a decision. I cannot guarantee your safety, he said. I understand that, I said. How can I in good conscience put a civilian, a woman no less, in harm's way? It is a choice I have made for myself, I said. I simply want to see him, to encourage him, and his friends as well. This last came to me all at once. I knew that military officers cared greatly for the morale of their men. It will make them do better, I said, wandering even farther from some true answer to his question. The colonel pursed his lips and lifted his chin. He looked away from me, out the tent. Many men were moving around out there. I could hear their footsteps and the hard whine of vehicle engines, but I kept my eyes on this man's face. A long moment passed, and finally the colonel said, the trenches here are well established. There are three lines of them, one at the front. You can't go there, of course, even if your son has rotated forward already, which may be the case. You can't go to the support line either. The German guns reach there quite easily, though it's not impossible for even this tent to receive a hit. I'll let you pass as far as the reserve line. You could return before dusk in the bombardments. And so I was put in an automobile, and a young officer drove me forward, and we bounced hard in the rutted earth, and there were large tents and the sign of the Red Cross, and there were cries muffled but clearly men crying out, and I closed my eyes, and I put my hand on my chest to calm the fluttering inside me, and I thought of my son, not Edward. It was the summer before he came into this world when I lost my firstborn, George. I lost him in his second summer. So very many mothers lost a child in its second summer. It was the killing time for children I should have given him a different name, or at least called him Georgie when I had a chance. He never had a child's name. He was named for my husband's father, and Jack called him his little man. And then at last I approached a vast wilderness of earth dead to the near horizon and a distant line of trees, and the earth was full of narrow pits stretching off as far as I could see, and they were all broken and angled and ragged, never going for more than a dozen yards before breaking off briefly in some other direction. 
The young officer led me from the automobile, and I insisted on carrying my own bag, and he brought me to a set of rough wooden steps, and I descended into the earth as if we'd gotten it wrong all this time, the preachers and their followers. This thin man with bad teeth, dressed in a drab uniform, was all there was of angels, and you packed your bag and you followed him down some log steps into the earth, and it was suddenly over your life. You could not draw a breath. The air was thick with the stink of bodies and decay, and the shadows were heavy on your eyes, and the strip of blue sky above was just a faded memory of the life that was gone from you. I staggered a little bit and put the bag down. Are you okay? the lieutenant asked, laying his hand on my arm. It comes to all of us, I said. Pardon me? I waved his concern away and picked up my bag again. We moved along the trench, which was lined on its sides and underfoot with wooden planks. I watched where I put my feet, with puddled water all about, black, shiny water, and there were little pockets of men huddled down together, a few sleeping in a lump, another group playing cards. A face lifted there, and a man with a British accent said, Mum, half in acknowledgment and half in wonder. And the other three faces lifted, and they all watched me, startled, but in an oddly muted way. And I moved on, and another group of men were smoking and chatting softly, and they too looked up and nodded at me. A solitary man lifted his hand, black with grime, and crossed himself, forehead, chest, left shoulder, right. We turned a corner. And immediately ahead were some men gathered around a great ugly black pot at full boil. They looked up and gaped at me. And the lieutenant went ahead to guide me to the side of the pot. But I stopped and said to these young men, Do you know my son? I've come to encourage him. And you too. He's Private Edward Marcus Gaines, 108th Infantry, 27th Division. Eddie Gaines, one of them said, I know him. Can you encourage our slum gum, another boy said. Is that your stew, you mean? Our stew. I peered into the pot, and it was the color of the Hudson River on a stormy day. Do I want to know what's in there, I asked. No, came a chorus of voices. Mrs. Gaines said the first one, who knew Eddie. I looked up through the column of steam from the pot, and the boy had a camera, and the others retreated, and he took my photo. We all stood in silence over the stew, and for a brief, odd moment, they were just a bunch of boys, my son's friends, and they dropped by for lunch. Eddie invited them and hadn't told me, and there we all stood, awkward like that in my kitchen. Then I thought of my son and where, in fact, he was, and I moved around the pot, and it smelled like the corner of a cellar, and the boys were helmeted and dark from grime, and this was another country. And I moved up beside my lieutenant, and we went along the trench until he touched my elbow and said, here. We turned to the left and walked into a dark slash in the wall of the trench, and he said, watch your step. And my eyes were rubbed hard by the dark, but I saw the dim downwardness of the steps, and I descended into a sharp, cold smell of earth. I went down as if this tattered angel had been from hell all along, and hell was simply cold and dark, not fire after all. But we came into a large dugout room, and there was a pallet and a hurricane lamp, and another thin man who rose from a small table with papers before him. The two men exchanged a greeting, though there was no snapping to, no saluting, and the lieutenant gave this new officer my letter from the colonel, and the officer angled it to the lamp and read it. This is Captain Morgan, the lieutenant said. Finally, he said, I've read this twice. He paused as if trying to find more words. I waited. He opened his mouth, closed it, twitched a little at the shoulders. Yes, I finally said. I'll see if he's not forward, the captain said. He left me without another word. I stood there for what felt like a long while. I did not think to sit down. This place was the captain's, and he'd not said to have a seat or to make myself comfortable. He'd just gone up the steps and left me inside the earth. His desk was covered with papers, 
and a map spread out, and a pistol lay there beside them as well. His bed was a pallet on a dugout step of dirt. There was a table with a few books, some newspapers. A few photos were pinned to the earthen wall. I took a step forward. The light was dim, and the figures were small, standing on the porch of a wood frame house with dormers and a maple tree. Then I felt something else in this place. I turned. No one had entered, but still I felt it. Then my gaze fell to the floor, and there in the spill of kerosene light was a rat as big as a squirrel. He was sitting on his haunches and calmly licking his paw and then wiping at his face like a cat. He was grooming himself, this rat that would go out later tonight and dine on sewage and corpses. I am not a squeamish woman. I did not cry out at this sight, but I touched my chest, held myself hard there to stop the fluttering. Then the rat paused, and he looked over his shoulder and lowered himself to all fours and scurried into the shadows. A moment later, my son appeared. I took a step toward him as he descended. Mother, he said, his voice terribly flat. This represented a change in him. I had always been mama. I was prepared to take him in my arms, but I stopped as he had stopped at the foot of the stairs. I found myself looking about for small talk. Uh, your captain, I said. He seemed burdened. Edward furrowed his brow, not wanting to talk small and not knowing how to stop it. Finally, he said, he's been here nine months now. The officers are good for about six, and then they start to fall apart. I should have felt bad for Captain Morgan, but the sadness that dragged itself into my chest at that moment was for my son, for his having this knowledge of how it is that men fall apart, and for his calling me mother. What have you done, he asked. You're not happy to see me, I said. I'm a soldier, he said. I'm in France. The front line is a thousand yards away. I may die there tonight. This is why I've come, I said. Though I hadn't thought of it in these terms, that my child, my one remaining child, was thinking of dying. But of course he was. I'm rotating forward in a few hours, he said. For a moment, I thought of taking him up and carrying him away, there was a surge in me, and I felt as if I was suddenly strong enough to sling this overgrown boy over my shoulder and carry him away. We should all do that, all the mothers of the world, I thought. Just pack a bag and come out here and carry these children home. The German mothers, too. It would take all of us doing this at once, but instead, of course, we kissed them goodbye, and, and, and told them we were proud, and we packed a knit sweater in the bag they carried. Do you, do you have your sweater, I asked him. Mother, he said, sharply, looking away. I'd helped him pack his bag. I'd waved a flag at the train station. They'd given flags to all the mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and wives and sweethearts, and we waved them with all 48 stars now, and a brass band played, and we shouted, hooray for the war. We'd cleaned their faces and sent them away. I shouldn't have come, I said. Edward shrugged. Can I have a hug and kiss goodbye then? Sure, he said. And he crossed the space in two steps, and his arms were around me, this grown child, this soldier, this man. We hugged, and I kissed him on both cheeks, and he kissed me on mine, and he smelled bad, my son. He needed a bath, and then he was gone, up the steps, and I thought of lifting him, drip, dripping from his bath, and wrapping him in a towel, and I stopped this memory at once. That was a long time ago. I sat down on the edge of the captain's bed. I could not stand. 
I looked at my bag where I'd left it in the middle of the room. I sat that way for a long while, and I watched the circle of light on the floor, waiting for the rat to return, but he did not. Then there was a sound at the top of the stairs. It was the captain. Is it all right, he asked. Yes, I said. He came down as quiet as the rat, and he stood before me. I found that I wanted to cry, and I worked on that, holding back the tears before I looked up at him. Finally, I did. The captain's face was dark, with the lamp behind him, but I could see his eyes, darker than the shadows, and he said, he hasn't been here long enough. I didn't understand. He sensed it. To appreciate your gesture, he said. I clenched back the tears for a final time. Captain Morgan jittered before me, trying to hold still, obviously, but he shifted ever so slightly from foot to foot, and his hands were shoved hard into his pockets, perhaps to keep them from trembling. Where is your mother today, I asked. Omaha, he said. I patted the pallet next to me, and for a moment he hesitated. Please, I said. He sat down. I lifted my arm and put it around him. I could feel him trembling. Then he laid his head on my shoulder. Softly, very softly, I said, You're a good boy. Your mother loves you. This program was made possible through a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Louisiana Public Broadcasting.